thinking it in more common sense terms, remember that in order to expand, the gas has to do work on the piston. Right. And in order to compress the gas, you have to do work on the piston. But here we're neither expanding nor compressing, so there's no opportunity for any work to be done. The last way to think about it is remember that the work is force times distance. Well, since the piston isn't moving, no distance is being moved, so there can't be any work. Now, how can we figure out the heat that's being exchanged here? Well, we can use a very similar formula. Except, remember that this symbol stood for the molar specific heat at constant pressure. Well, logically, now we should use the molar specific heat at constant volume. Here we have the molar specific heat at constant volume. Molar specific heat and the subscript means at constant volume. So this tells us how much heat it takes to raise the temperature of one mole of the gas by one degree Kelvin holding the volume constant. And this tells us how much heat it takes to raise the temperature of one mole of the gas by one degree Kelvin if we hold the pressure constant. All right, and now we want to know how to write, the, uh, how to um, figure out what the molar specific heat is. Well, here's what I was thinking a second ago. I got, I got the CP and the CV mixed up. Okay. Actually, for a monatomic gas, the C sub V is 3 halves R. For a diatomic gas, it's 5 halves R. And as we were talking about, a monatomic gas is something like helium, and a diatomic gas is something like oxygen, where the molecule has two atoms. Let's see if we can figure out whether this should be bigger or smaller than this. Uh, let's see here. So, We take this equation, if we solve this equation for Q, we can get this. If we solve this equation for Q, we get this. What does this tell us in common sense terms? Well, it tells us that if we add heat to something, that will either go to raise its energy or allow it to do work. And in a sense, this is just common sense. Any energy that we put in has to do something. It's either going into raising the internal energy or it's being used to do work. Uh, remember, if it's raising the internal energy, it's changing the temperature. So another way of putting that is, any energy that we add by heat will either raise the temperature or it will move the piston. Either raise the temperature or move the piston. So let's say we're doing a constant volume process where we add heat. Well then, all the heat will go to raise the temperature. Mm -hmm. Because the work would be zero. Now let's think about a constant pressure process. Well, we know a constant pressure process does do work. So now, some heat goes to increase the energy, and some heat goes to do work. So is that going to make it easier or harder to raise the temperature? for the constant pressure process. Well, the constant pressure, okay. yeah. Harder to raise the temperature, because some of the heat is being wasted on work, so to speak. If our goal was to raise the temperature, we wouldn't want to waste any of that energy on work. So this is the pressure where it's, this is the process where it's more difficult to raise the temperature, which comes from the delta U. It's more difficult to raise the temperature under a constant pressure process because some of the heat is being wasted, so to speak, on work. Whereas none, there wasn't any work being done in the constant volume case because we were holding the piston fixed. So should CP be big or small compared to CV? Smaller. Since this is the process where it's difficult to raise the temperature, does that mean it's going to take a lot of heat to raise oh. the temperature or a little? A lot. A lot? Bigger. That's right. The specific heat tells us how hard it is to raise the temperature because mm -hmm. it tells us how much heat it takes. Yes. If the specific heat is big, that means it takes a lot of heat to raise the temperature, which must be because it's hard to raise the temperature. I think last time we talked about how 
water has a very high specific heat, that shows that water is a heat sink. It's hard to, raise, it's hard to change the temperature of water. So, how can we find the CP from the CV? Should I add something to the CV or should I subtract something? I should add something. Good. And you could, couldn't figure out uh, just uh, out of our head, unless uh, we were really good at physics, we couldn't just figure out what to add. All right. Uh, but somebody who's smarter than us figured out that you should add R. So, this is what we have to add to this to figure out um, the specific heat at constant pressure. So as I was mentioning earlier, you would not be usually given the specific heats for an ideal gas. You're expected to be able to figure them out just based on whether it's monatomic or diatomic. Based on this, you can figure out what the C sub V is, and then you can also figure out the C sub P if you needed that. And you want, want to avoid the mistake that I made, which was confusing these two things. These are the equations for the C sub V, and this is the equation for CP. Okay. Uh, but we should be able to remember that the CP is bigger than the CV, or at least be able to figure that out going through this logic. A, kind of a long chain of logic, but this is a good thing to try to go through again on your own to really understand the concepts. Okay. I think this really helps us to understand that the first law of thermodynamics is kind of just common sense. It's just a way of bookkeeping about where the energy is going. Mm -hmm. If the energy comes in as heat, it has to go somewhere, either to change the temperature or to move the piston. Well, again, here we have an equation for the work and an equation for the heat. So how would we figure out the delta U? Um, you would add them. Good. Or subtract them because it's squared by. But we can be even more specific here. In this particular process, what can we say about the delta U for a constant volume process? It's just equal to the heat. That's right, because the work is going to be zero. Mm -hmm. If W is zero, delta U equals Q. So this formula actually also tells us the delta U. This formula would also tell us the delta U in this case. We know that for a constant volume process, this equation tells us the heat, and therefore for a constant volume process, this equation, the same equation should tell us the delta U, because in this case the delta U is equal to the heat because the work is zero. Now here's something that's a little bit subtle. Remember that the, for an ideal gas, the delta U only depends on the temperature. For an ideal gas, the delta U is basically a way of measuring the temperature. Well. If we have a constant volume process that goes from, say, uh, I don't know, 10 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius, we know that this equation would tell us the delta U. But let's say we had a non-constant volume process. That also went from 10 degrees to 30 degrees Celsius. Well, even though it's not constant volume, it's still starting at the same temperature and moving to the same temperature, so it must have the same delta U as this one over here, because the delta U only depends on the temperature. For an ideal gas, temperature and, I and U are just different ways of measuring the same thing. That's why I wrote this equation up here. Here's where I'm putting the equations that are true for any type of process. Okay. So even though we proved this equation for constant volume, it can actually be used in any, in any process. Now, I think this is kind of confusing here um, because then that makes us wonder what's, what does the V here stand for? So let's just review. Um, the only time you would use C sub P is to find the heat of a constant pressure process. But there's two times you can use C sub V. You can use C sub V to find the heat for a constant volume process, but only for, it only gives you the heat for a constant volume process. But it gives you the delta U for any process. Okay. That's the thing that I think is confusing. So even though I've got the, this, this, the, uh, the subscript V over here, this equation is true for any process. Okay. So, when do you have to pay attention to this little subscript V and when can you ignore it? Well, if you're trying to find Q, 
Well, then you have to pay attention to the subscript. Q for a constant pressure, you need C sub P. And Q for a constant volume, you need C sub V. But when can you ignore this little subscript? Uh, well, when you're trying to find delta U, delta U for any process is C sub V. Even if it's not constant volume. Even if it's not constant volume, we would still use this constant, this constant volume constant. So that's a little confusing. I tried to explain why that was with this little change in temperature argument. But the fact is, I, I myself find that kind of confusing. So maybe we just want to put this in our cheat sheet and have it memorized. We just want to have a cheat sheet that clearly shows which formulas are only true in specific cases yeah. and which formulas are always true. Because I find it confusing myself to understand what the distinction is between these two things.